Hey there, just ran from bed tattooing. It is 5 a.m. and I couldn't sleep, so I got a coffee. <clears throat> Still a little under the weather. And I figured, hey, let's make a really long video. Might get a little bit tired and go back to bed. Anyways, let's talk about how you can improve your shading and filling of tattoos today. Intro credits. All right, now that that's over with, we're gonna get into some deep theory here. I think we might actually use some of the chapters and stuff that are naturally in YouTube to try and break some of this stuff down. But let's let's just tackle this and, and make a longer video and see what we can do. Instead of these little two minute bites, which some people say have been really good, but I think that it's nice being able to see stuff at the same time. It's, it's actually really nice being able to understand why you're doing stuff, which is kind of the whole point of why we started this channel. Like it's not hard to tell you how to do something. But why, right, can be really, really important. So let's break this down. <clears throat> I got uh, asked a question on Facebook uh, a couple days ago, and I was uh, sent an image with what seemed to be some color on fake skin that was next to another color, and you could see really harsh lines <clears throat> inside of the fill there's no proper overlap between the colors and it just it was just kind of a weak image right so the person's asking like, how do i get rid of this stuff well to understand how to get rid of it i think first we have to try to get into like why that's occurring right and if we can understand why we can identify how this is happening once we do that we can understand what we need to do to fix it and why that's going to happen right so <clears throat> More often than not, when we get to like two blends, and we'll do this, right? We'll start off with blends. It must be part one. Blends. What we're often seeing with people, especially when they're first tattooing, is they're coming in, and what they're doing is they're creating their fill with these very tight circles, because there's a lot of misconception in tattooing that we need to do these tight circles, especially with like flat or mag groupings, to try and do a fill. Now, <clears throat> for the most part, Tight circles should only be relegated to round groupings, right? Um, before we get into, I guess, figuring this out, that, that, let's talk about that first, right? Why do we only use tight circles with rounds? So yeah, I'll just do this one. Boop. Tight circles. Question mark. So if we look at the, the actual shape, it's kind of fun, just throwing a boop in there, right? of each one of the needles when they're put next to each other, right? We're gonna have a round, a flat. I don't actually know how they fucking label those anymore. We're gonna have a mag. And so let's do one more, because we can do that. and a stack, right? <clears throat> now each one of these groupings can be used as they are <coughs> in many different ways to try and fill a tattoo, right? Oh, wait, we got one more, don't we? Let's do that, mag, slash rounded mag. Now, just looking at the shapes of these with like a simple illustration on a whiteboard, you can kind of tell that they're gonna react inside the different, in the body differently, right? The rounds as they come out are relatively round, right? Our flats are just gonna be a flat plane that come across and our curved mags or mags are woven, right? Where the needles are actually staggered back and forth over top of each other. <clears throat> now, and stacks are just two flats stacked on top of each other, right? For even amount of needles, even stacking. <clears throat> now, when we go to put these into the skin, and we're using different types of hand motions, they're gonna react differently. And now we're, we're not trying to pay attention to what's happening to the skin. Realistically, what we're trying to pay attention to is what's happening to the needle, right? Now when you take a grouping like a round and we use tight circles with it, what's happening to that needle grouping is that as it's being spun around, right? Not twisted, just like rotated around inside the tube, is that all of the needles inside of that round grouping, right? Boop, boop, boop. I'm gonna use a big old grouping there. They're all gonna come in contact with the skin evenly. 
so when you're moving it around its axis, right, and filling it in, as long as your needles are relatively within that, you know, 65 to 80 degree mark, and your hand is being straight, use the elbow, maybe wrist a little bit to do the fill, all those needles are evenly hitting and they're like able to saturate, right? Usually what happens when people are doing this, they're not doing tight circles, or you're actually using loose circles and you end up with these like holes in the center, right? That's not being tattooed in. So then you're kind of forced to like go back over it and try to fix it, <coughs> which, you know, seems really, you know, not efficient time-wise. So people try to avoid doing most fills with rounds, which is silly because rounds are literally there for maximum saturation in a single spot, right? Same with stacks and flats for the most part, but just in a different way. But it's a strong, immediate concentration of pigment in a circular area is what a round does, right? It helps get things just set into the skin. <clears throat> so you can do tight circles with something like a round, it works fine, right? When we get into something like a flat, a stack, or a mag, especially a rounded mag, which we'll probably have to do another illustration on this, the actual effect of it we take the needles coming sideways, right? Boop, boop. Coming into the skin. The point of where these are going to be contacting the skin, right? Let's do this 3D. It might make it a little bit easier. Boop, boop, boop. Is going to be <clears throat> the point where they contact the skin is going to be determined based on like how that machine angle is, right? So if we're looking at like an XY plane with a Z axis on this. If your stuff isn't absolutely dead nut straight following that line, so if you're following a line or trying to do a fill on this, and let's say that your, your tube line isn't aligned with where you're trying to go, and maybe it's kicked off a little bit like this, and you're trying to do your circles, your fills back and forth, you're, you're not actually having those needles hit in the intended fashion, which would be to like scoop into the skin and fill that area in a linear fashion, right? You start moving roundabouts and circles and stuff, you're going to end up getting tipping. So that's where one side of the needle is going to hit more, or the grouping is going to hit more, burying a certain needle more than the other side. <clears throat> or you're going to get a wibble wobble, where all you're going to be doing is just bouncing back and forth between the two sides. So you're only using half the needle effectively, right? So when you're starting to do tight circles with something like this, especially with the smaller groupings, right? What you're going to end up seeing is this kind of weird chopping fashion that's going to happen that'll have probably let's do it like that one side that may look like it's actually well saturated some holes much like around this on the inside as well as like broken or soft edges on the outside <clears throat> we're going to see this with stacks as well and as those groupings start to get larger right if we're going to say like oh criminally we'll, we'll do like a greater than a seven mag and same with this like greater than what was it like a stacked 11 um, what you're going to start seeing is that <clears throat> the needles inside of them uh, that are installed on the bar inside of the tube are actually going to bend and flex, right? So like, especially with stacks, which is just basically like a square round liner, um, <clears throat> as they're being pushed across the skin moving forward, the needles will actually wag at the bottom of it. So they're soldered onto the back of the bar and they'll end up moving back and forth, right? which is just going to amplify this, this effect that you're getting off of your flats or stacks. So if they're moving a lot, going back and forth, and you're trying to do tight circles, all you're doing is just causing these little flicks to happen inside the skin, which is going to just result in more inconsistent... My mic's falling off there. Inconsistent saturation when you're actually doing the fill. So it's just kind of a pain in the butt, right? Now, when we get to mags <clears throat> specifically, and we start looking at that grouping as it is, where there's these woven spots in between the needles, and there's a large gap around each one of them, there's a lot more play that comes into effect when you're actually putting the needles into the skin, <clears throat> especially if you're doing tight circles these needles will move a lot and it'll be inconsistent with how they're going. Now, this is kind of the idea of these, with these being a shader needle, right? Is that you're getting an uneven dispersion of pigment that's scattered, loose, and not as saturated as around that you can like easily uh, uh, apply to a tattoo to like blend two colors together, right? Because if we have a lot of color in one area, and a lot in another, and we're like, geez, we need to put these together. Well, it's easy enough just to butt those two colors up together and grab a mag and blend over top with two of the same colors mixed together in tube and cap or whatever else, right? To, to make them achieve that blend and make it look smooth. 
So <clears throat> tight circles with something like these is, is not only, it's gonna wear out the skin way faster than if you were to try and do it with one of these other groupings specifically, but it's also just gonna result in completely uneven application of the pigment. Because especially when they're rounded, you start moving that thing around in a circle to do these tight circle fills back and forth and all that stuff, all these needles are just gonna be bouncing all over the place, right? It's not gonna to totally be straight. It's not the chisel end of a pen. It's a bunch of needles all stuck together. So they're gonna end up wiggle waggling. <coughs> and when you end up trying to use that on top of a person's actual skin, not even just the fake skin, but real skin, you're gonna end up tearing it up really quickly. So most people, when they start using this, they'll be doing, oh, do you know, tight circles and keep it at like 90 degrees and try to float it into the skin and let them feed back the machine, you know, tell you how far you're supposed to go with this. That's just, it leaves so much up to chance because everyone's skin is different and even everyone's fake skin is gonna be different with this as well, right? So do <clears throat> you need to think about like how these things are actually like interacting with your substrate when you're using it, right? So like tight circles can work with rounds, but flats, mag stacks, they're just not really made for that, right? So if we go back to our initial I always forget, I shouldn't use the green or the orange, right? It's just 5 a.m., so I mean, it's not too big of a deal. If we go back to our initial query, right, where we had somebody who was trying to blend over top black with, I think it was red, it was coming over top of it. And what we're seeing is, one, a gap, but two, the big choppiness is going to happen here, where we're seeing, like, literal lines inside that that fill, we can make an assumption, one of two things, like right? one, they're trying to do this with a liner and they're just like going crazy back and forth. But because of like the picture I'd seen, the saturation that was in there, maybe I'll put it up on the video too so you can see. <clears throat> when we're seeing something like this, it's, it's usually gonna be from a mag, right? And instead of having the mag coming flat, whoop, we'll do it like this, flat and being pushed into it, much like if you're trying to shove it in, like Tabori, right? They're saying they're trying to do tight circles. And that wag that we were talking about is occurring here. We're gonna get very strong edges, a weak center where the needles are kind of like realigning. And you're gonna see it a lot because people are doing circles as well. <laughs> There's gonna be a pause point when you're coming around. If I'm coming around and I come back around and I come back around. Come... There's always gonna be these little spots on both sides. One, where we're overlapping, where you're gonna see that darker tone of pigment too. And uh, two, <clears throat> we're still gonna have these valleys left in between stuff. So usually that, that gap that we'll see in between this stuff is, is just gonna be there from somebody moving their hands. Now usually, the, I think the video, I had, or the picture I'd seen, I'll put up in the video, this looks like it's somewhere between, let's do a little, less, maybe like 1.5 to three millimeters in thickness. <clears throat> it's not very big, right? It's, it's pretty small when you see somebody whipping their hand around, you know, in a blown up fashion because we're the size of a needle, it's like, oh my gosh, you're moving so much realistically. Like you're barely moving your hand trying to get a really tight pack on that stuff, which if you want to try with a ballpoint pen is usually a good way to train yourself with this stuff. But <clears throat> you're still going to have that center line. Even with my marker, I can see where there's going to be less this one, right? Ink laid on the whiteboard. Uh, and stronger points on each one of the edges of this. Now if I take it and I actually, like, do I have a chisel one on this? I do somewhere. So I'm using something like a flat. I'm trying to keep this totally flat and even with the skin. Right. You're gonna be doing little tight circles. It's not hard to fill when you're using a pen, but I don't have any wag with this, right? If I try to do a bunch of these lines all overlapped with each other, I'm gonna start getting a washing and a lack of space and blending over top of these, right? Now, this is an illustration with this, like we all know that I'm actually just pushing ink away that hasn't dried fully on the whiteboard, but it'll show you kind of the same thing that's happening when you're using these needles, right? <clears throat> Rather than trying to do tight circles with mags to do in a fill, just remember they're freaking blending needle, come at it straight and like literally just push it into the skin. This is that box method I talk about, right? It, it'll look like you're doing circles or ovals into the skin, but realistically what you're doing is you're just shoving into the skin, pulling up and moving out, right? So you're pushing in with the skin and you, like with intention, right? When you put the needle on your substrate, push it in. 
when it reaches the end of whatever that, that range is supposed to be, you're going to pick up, just flick your wrist up, pull back, and then pull in again. So it's a constant pulling motion, right? I'm going to pull up, out, and around, and then push back in. Whoop, that's a box, right? <clears throat> and it's hard for people to like, kind of get that one. You just got to stay loose when you're trying to do this. You're not trying to, you know, fill in a piece of paper. Like you're trying to saturate the skin. But before we get into how to actually fix that blend. Give me a second. All right, back out of there. So the next thing we should talk about is, especially like everyone's using mags just incessantly, right? So let's look at one of two things, right? So let's look at the straight and a rounded mags configuration, right? We have a rounded mag, we're gonna see our needles. Wow, yeah, it's really early. There, and we've got to start round grouping, right? Might as well do this so that there's some type of congruency with what I had said before. <clears throat> um, when these hit the skin, right, most common thought is that the area right around the needle is going to be depressed or accepted into it, and that needle is going to be able to pass through the skin and deposit the pigment. And this is with fake skin or real skin, right? Realistically, as soon as it's hitting, this goes into a decent stretch on stuff, which we don't have to worry about with fake skin, which is kind of fun. Um, what's happening is, is the actual substrate around it is actually bending a much greater range or area than we actually may assume, right? It's not just going to be focused around that needle. So as that bend is going, what we're doing is we're accommodating the needle into that space. So now the, the thought with rounded mags with a lot of people is that because the skin is going to be depressed around it, you're going to get an even spacing of those needles all entering the skin at the same depth, right? Which is not right. As these needles come down, let's say that we just like kind of copy this exact same line here, right? We have this coming in. What we're actually going to have is shallower edges at the sides here because these needles are going to be absorbing the most part of the impact that's the center of the grouping where the rounded mag is, and they're going to go the deepest. The other sides are only going to partially commit that pigment into that area that you're working in, right? So what we're having technically with rounded mags is literally a round needle, which is just in the center, and then we have some things that end up shading on the side. That's why a lot of people claim like rounded mags work so great when you're filling in. Yeah, it's only because you're using like, you know, up to 50% maybe, depending on how your hand positioning is with these things, for them to actually go in. That looks like a cock and balls. Oops. I'd be in trouble if I was in school right now. People would be like, ha, ah, Professor Ryan, you are a dork. Um, sorry. I got to finish my coffee here in a little bit. Boop, boop, boop. <clears throat> so if it's mounted like that, don't use it anyways. So if we keep that idea, right, about there's only a part of this that's actually gonna be congruent with this. So rounded mags can work really, really well if you're trying to blend stuff and fill, but it's gonna be just as effective for a fill if you're just using a round liner, right? It's pretty simple. <clears throat> and this is something I, I try to try to teach people quite often, right? Is like relying on these these rounded mags to, to do large fills does work, right? But we're looking at things kind of weird because we see this big needle and we see how much, you know, all this color is going in there, right? But if you just did a single pass, which we've tested this before, you do a single pass, just push a single whoop, nine round mag, right? Into the skin or nine round next to it, what you're gonna end up with, if you just do a single pass in, is when it heals, an area of very strong pigment saturation in the center of it and very weak on the outside. Now, <clears throat> if you're using fake skin and you're trying to practice, you gotta remember this, right? Because when you're trying to do your fills, your overlaps, like if we went back to that, that previous example with our blends, we have a rounded mag that's being used to try and blend things because you know it may work effectively in skin. We have this choppy bit here, the things that are trying to be pulled into it. 
what we're going to start seeing, especially depending on how the actual hand is placed with a rounded mag, let's say we have our mag here, but it's tipped a little bit, right? Because we're trying to see what we're doing, which, I mean, it's another talk altogether. All we're going to be getting is just part of that needle actually hitting, and the other half just being, I mean, if it's even touching, depending on how steep that angle is, not even coming into contact or just just you know scuffing the top of the uh, the skin or the fig skin that you're using so it's so like where are those angles and making sure that you're like leading flat against that line that you're trying to create right with that tube line matching the line that you're trying to push is consistent right <clears throat> if we have our our needle coming in straight and it's coming in straight and pushing straight our concentration is going to be here but if we're maybe right-handed and we're trying to see what we're doing while we're working, and we're only using a part of that needle grouping when it goes into the skin, up to half of it is just not gonna be hitting, right? All you're doing is just using, once again, brown liner. So, how to fix this, right? First off, easiest way is, use the needles the way that they're intended to be used, right? We're gonna do a shovel or a box, method right box method works really well with rounded mags especially because implying pressure and like being kind of aggressive when it when you're with it when you're pulling into the skin ensures that you're actually going to be getting that needle to be hitting the substrate like consistently moving forward with intention and you're going to be utilizing hopefully more of the needle grouping than you normally would if you're trying to just do little tight circles on a corner <clears throat> But I mean, realistically, if you are just wanting to try this out and you end up with something like this where the edges are gonna be a little bit more saturated and we've got all these valleys and stuff on the inside, go back in, especially on fake skin, grab a round liner and just go in and like fill in that center part that doesn't work or fill up the back part. If it's not human skin, you don't have to worry about overworking it, right? You can play around with it. Go in and take your time, commit to it. Um, another thing to do is like make sure that your depth is right when you're doing this stuff, especially on human skin. But on fake skin, I mean, no, no doy, right? If your if your fake skin is X thick, however many millimeters or whatever it is, you can go ahead and test how far that you need to put your needle out <laughs> to get this to work effectively by going to the edge of your your fake skin and you put your needle out. <laughs> so that it's depressed and then you just literally like shrink up the top of that tube line pull it back or just if you're using a rotary until it's only that far <laughs> right now you know that it's going to be able to pass all the way through into the bottom of that that's fun it's still too far cut it in half <laughs> if your fake skin is i've got it here let me just grab this we're going to start doing some illustrations if your th fake skin is this thick, right, you shouldn't have your needle out four mil. That's just silly. I mean, like if you if you put this on something, you'd just be able to punch through it, right? So uh, I don't know if that's going to be in focus or not, but set your needle to the depth that you're supposed to be using this stuff, right? It's half the thickness. If you have a micrometer and you can actually gauge how thick that stuff is, go grab it. If not, <coughs> take a pen. Mark the side, ballpoint pen, get it nice and wet, stick it on a piece of paper, right? So you're just gonna take it and dab it on there and it'll come up with a line. And you'll be like, okay, take a ruler, <laughs> right? Do, 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 do. Measure how thick that line is and cut it in half. That's how far your needle should go when you're working with fake skin. Human skin's a bit different, right? Because it has give, you're not on a hard substrate, like the freezer that's always here when we're doing our recordings. So the skin is actually gonna move a lot more up and down. So you have to set it differently. That's where we usually have the thickness of human skin is gonna be our gauge of that stuff, right? Which is gonna be around two millimeters. So if, if we know our needle is gonna be around two millimeters, all we're doing is at that point in time, we're sure that the needle is not gonna to go too far to damage the skin and we can adjust the actual depth with acoustics on this stuff, right? That's where stretching comes in. For going into human skin, we can adjust how much movement that that skin is gonna have, right? 
if we think about it like this, where a needle is actually going to be coming into contact with it and ends up undulating due to the uh, reciprocating motion of it, we can end up changing how far it'll actually, it's just a big one here, how far it's going to be moving up and down by applying stretch to it. It's like tuning a guitar, guitar string, right? A whole lot of stretch, we're not going to have a whole lot of movement that's going on here. And that needle is not going to have to work very hard to get through. Realistically, when we're trying to do a tattoo on human skin, though, what we're trying to do is match the stitch rate of the machine. Well, that's a really bad R, isn't it? Of the machine. So this is going to be like your cycles per second or whatever, right? Of it going up and down to the actual acoustics, the sine wave of the skin moving up and down in response to that stretch reacting to the needle hitting it which may seem a little bit complicated, but every time the needle's hitting, we were talking about with the rounded mag, you're gonna get a depression, right? And then the needle's gonna go through. So if you can time it through your stretch where that skin is going down and as the needle's coming up, the skin is returning at the same rate, we're keeping it at a certain tight, tightness, and then the needle's not gonna have to work as hard to actually enter the skin because as it's coming back up, the skin is coming back up as well and it's chasing it. So when the skin all of a sudden has reached its, you know, apex, max uh, amplitude of, of height there, the needle is starting to come back down. There is going to be some type of movement from this coming back up, which is gonna decrease the amount of force needed by the needle to actually enter into it. That's stretching, that's what we do it. <clears throat> it's just timing, it's like a guitar string. Easiest way to do that. So anyways, we'll do a deep dive into that in another time. So. Let's talk about how to fix those nasty blends. All right, so if we go back to the initial spot where we see these things coming back together and they're not very clean. First thing we need to worry or ask ourselves about, not even worry about, is one of two things, right? Is this a fill? Or is this a shade? So if we're trying to do solid fill like we're doing like American traditional, something like that, the idea is to have saturation, right? We want to have a lot of color in there. We're trying to make stuff really stick. So let's say we're doing a fill on this. Rather than thinking about each one of the individual layers on this as something that can't touch or, you know, you've got to try to butt things up next to each other. Remember that, especially with fake skin, you're working with a substrate that is pretty forgiving, right? When we're doing our, our fills and colors, what we're trying to do is create a gradation where this is going to be the darkest, we'll say, and it's going to move to the lightest. Now, if... <laughs> it's super busy out today. If the space between the dark and the light is going to be a gradation between black and a color, like red, what we're going to do is we have to think about this space, right? the back of this all the way up to this, how to make that look smooth. And it's just a, an illusion, right? It's not really smooth. And we can get into like the actual science of how this stuff looks like inside the skin, the histology of the pigment when it's been implanted. But realistically, all we're trying to do is create an aggregation of one pigment that blends in with the other. So we do that by fully saturating one big space, fully saturating the other space, and then we're gonna have a space in between. That's gonna be the blend, right? If these two colors are butted up next to each other, we have two pockets, almost like cups of ink, right? Filled with stuff. We're trying to create something that's between it. We can take our dark at one point in, uh, at the end of wherever our full saturation is, and we're gonna one third overlap our black. Let's be one third black moving this way. So realistically that space that's going to be filled inside here with black isn't just that back spot, right? Bye bye eraser. It's going to be this whole swath. So where our space is here, right? Super dark fanning out. Now when we go to mix the color back over top, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to take our color and we're going to come back and we're going to one third overlap that other side as well. Right? So this is our overlap. And what happens when we overlap is you're going to have a bunch of particles of color 
implanted into the substrate you're working on, mixing in that substrate with the black. Pretty simple, eh? So you can just go over a bunch of it. That's how you do a blend. That's that's called blending in skin normally, right? If you're a little bit afraid about doing a one-third overlap, maybe the if you're working on like human skin, this this may overwork the skin especially. You'll see a lot of people, especially newer tattooers, that they'll have like a nice color blend that looks it looks crispy and stuff. But you'll see like these little holes in the skin because it's just been like way overworked. And when it heals, you get those lines of scabs through it because they just overworked the skin trying to blend over top of each other, right? Let me pick up my my eraser here. So if you're doing this in skin, there's another way you could do this, past blending in skin. And we'll do a blend in tube. Let's go with the blue and green again, that was fun. If we have our space where we want dark, and this is gonna be our light, we're trying to transition from one side, dark to light, and we have that gap where we go over top, what we can do is we can have our ink caps, boop, 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 and we have our black here, our color here, and then this one we're gonna have one quarter black. All right, so full black in here, full color in here. We're gonna take one quarter black. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our needles, once we've laid in our color, giving it a good rinse, we're gonna dip <clears throat> from our color into our black, and keep doing that, mixing, adding more from the color, bop, 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 into this. I mean, you can just fill it up with some color if you want to. I normally just like mix on the fly because I end up creating a lot of waste if I don't do that. But I mean, if you're just doing this at home, it's probably easier just to do it this way. Um, and fill it up with color, right? So we'll go one quarter black, three quarters color. Mix it. If you got needle bars, it's really easy to mix in the caps. You can just like take a needle bar out um, and the loop end, just hold it between your fingers, put in the cap and just twist it back and forth. It makes a little stir rod, mixes it up really quickly. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna take, once it's mixed, this stuff, and we're gonna do a 1 8 overlap on top of the color there. It's really simple, right? You're gonna have your transition from your black to your mixed tone. And we're only using one quarter black because black is like really, really, really dense on average when you get commercially available black. If you have half black plus a color, it's gonna be really dark tint. So it's easier to take like quarter black, three quarter, have like a mid-tone dark that's actually gonna be able to blend between these two a little bit easier. And if you need to lighten it up, you can always take this and dip into your color, right? That's why you always establish it first. If you go from this to this, you're, tint you're gonna end up tinting this. So it'll just keep getting darker until both of these end up neutralizing and kind of becoming the same tone. Um, but anyways, <clears throat> you'll take this and just like color over top. Super simple. If you're seeing edges and lines where the stuff hasn't blended out really well, simple. Take your stuff here and then you fan backwards against it. All you're gonna do is just brush gently, right? With a flick motion, we call it whip shading from the point of saturation where these two things overlap back into the opposite color. And same with the lighter stuff. If you're having a bit of a line, <laughs> a lot of buses running by today, on one side where the, where the mid-tone or your, your tinted uh, color is gonna be moving towards like your fully saturated color, you're gonna do the same thing. Where those spots overlap, all you're gonna do is just take the same tone and flick into the opposite color. That'll create your blend, right? You can use a mag for that, it works great. <laughs> so that's the easiest way to fix it and that's the theory behind how all this stuff is gonna work. When we're doing blends, use a mag. That's what they're there for. That's why they're called a shader needle, right? And you can do this with round shaders as well. But I mean, for the most part, I don't think many people use <coughs> round shaders as round shaders anymore. They usually use them as liners, which I don't agree with because that's not what they're made for. But I mean, it can build an entire house with a hammer. May not look pretty, but I can build it. It's just easier to use a saw to cut the wood, right? Let's just do that last one, round shaders. If you look at a round shader, and we're gonna be looking down the barrel at this, right? Round liners, we'll do a five. We're very close together, right? Round shaders have a bigger space between them. what's called hollow fives. We used to call them anyways. Now, if you think about a mag, right? These are gonna be equivalent while this one is not. 
a mag is going to have that spacing between its needles, right? So you can think about how those are going into the skin. If we're looking at the skin, we're having a hole made, a hole made, and a hole made next to each other, right? We think about it on the 3D, which I guess we can do that too. We're going to have, you know, pew, pew, pew. That aggregation of, of needles is going to be further spaced apart, right? So that round grouping is actually going to have a lot of skin that it's not going to be hitting. Well, if we have the same type of lineup with boop, 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 a tight liner, and they're all coming in, we have boop, boop, boop. A lot of space in between these that, you know, the needles are just closer together. <laughs> so you're gonna get more need, like more pigment in a tighter space. The further out that they are, the more it's gonna be spread out, right? Realistically, like mags, what you're using is five single needles. Like if it's a five mag, if it's a seven mag, it's seven single needles that are just attached to each other. They're not really working together, right? They're spread out and they're gonna be laying stuff in as such. And when they're rounded, right? <laughs> then you're having stuff just not hit at all the same. <laughs> well, the needles are coming in like this, but then we've got a couple that are just going to start picking up. <laughs> you know, it, it's not, it's not congruous. Yeah. Anyways, that I think is it. I was gonna be like, maybe there's something else. I'm like, ah, I think this is gonna be like a 30 or 35 minute, you know, video on this stuff. That's it. When you're, when you're doing your blends and you're trying to do it, remember you get a one third or one eighth, somewhere in between there, overlap of either direct single color dark tone to light tone that you're trying to blend together, which watch purples and yellows, Oof, sometimes those can be a pain in the butt. <clears throat> or you're gonna layer two individual colors side by side and then create a tint, and blend them together, flick off. Easiest way to do it, right? That's it for today. This is Brian from Better Tattoo and signing off. Hey, hey, hey.